you may notice that the chancel is a little light on people this morning. Deb and Colin are taking a much needed break and rest after the holiday season. Uh, the joke is a lot of times last Sunday is associate Sunday, uh, but somehow I drew the good straw and was able to take vacation on Associate Sunday somehow. Uh, so we uh, just kind of shifted Associate Sunday a, a week back. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, I ask that these words be pleasing unto you and our hearts full of your good word. In your name we pray, amen. So I did not grow up going to church camp. When I moved out here, it was actually my first real experience with church camp because growing up, I went to a general all-girls camp where we did basket weaving and canoeing and archery and all of those sorts of exciting things. Um, I went because my sister had originally gone, but she doesn't think that the woods are a valid life experience. So she only went for two years, and I went for 19. Um, so that's how we're a little different. Um, but I went as a, a camper, a counselor, and ultimately part of the leadership staff. And one of the things that always sticks with me about camp is before breakfast every morning, we would sing songs to kind of wake up our sleepy bodies and get the blood flowing and and all of those sorts of things. And if we were not singing energetically enough or uh, participating or still feeling a little sleepy, we would have certain songs that we would sing. And kind of similar to scales, you know, of waking up and getting energized. And if we weren't doing it good on our own, we had to go back and sing the, one of these two songs. And the one that stuck with me today was Rise and Shine. Does anybody know that song? I'm not going to make you sing it. But yeah, we've got some, some hands. So um, it's a song about Noah and the flood, and it talks about how the floody floody is coming, and the animals need to get on the arky arky, and how the landy landy is going to flood and eventually dry out. But the most important part is the chorus. And in this is where our emotions and our, our blood gets pumping because we have to rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. Rise and shine and give God the glory, glory. And this is the longest song in the entire world. It's got like a million verses, y'all. Because, I mean, the flood was really long, so apparently that's why you have to have a really long song. And so you are rising and shining till kingdom come. And if you are not pumped after that song then you must be dead. And so we would sing that before we could have breakfast. So you can imagine both how glad we were when we were done and how tired we were when we were done. We would do it until we were ready or until we were ready to fake it. This week on social media, for those of us who do that, there were a lot of posts saying goodbye to 2018 and hello to 2019. People recounting the ups and downs, the joys and heartaches of the previous year and lifting, looking forward to the hopes and dreams coming. And one of the things that I noticed is a lot of my friends had really hard years in 2018. Many friends were not just saying goodbye, but also good riddance. I'm done with you. There was hardship, death, lost jobs, rejection, and other difficulties along life's road. But the posts weren't just about the sadness they had seen, but about the hope. Every post ended with an uplifting message of, but next year will be better. Next year is new. They had decided to rise and shine on January 1st. Our scripture today in verse 4 sings, lift up your eyes and look around. Lift up your eyes and look around, for then you shall see and be radiant. I think now it's important to see why the author is asking the reader to be radiant and to look around. Isaiah is a really beautiful and deep and rich and varied book. It's one of our longer ones, and in it, some scholars argue, is not just one book, but two or possibly even three books, different movements, different 
uh, not just chapters, but feelings of book. And there are lots of different reasons people agree or disagree with looking at studying at the book this way, but it has to do with the historical horizon that is happening to the people at that time, the writing style and all of those sorts of things. Because um, even if it's written by one person, we grow in age and our voice that we kind of speak with changes. You know, even with us as children, we speak differently with different words and different cadences. And then you grow up and speak differently. Um, and so it's kind of possibly that the author is going through different things like that. So before, in chapters 1 through 39, the Israelites are either being dispersed or are dispersed. They're having a really, really hard time with different nations coming in and ruling over them or trying to rule over them. The lands that they're living in is shifting and changing, and nothing is really steady or firm for them. In these chapters, we see change and turmoil and judgment as some prevalent themes. And then at chapter 40, we see a shift in, in the chapter that the editors eventually the titled it they say it's God's people are comforted. Signals are changed into a different type of writing. Today, if you looked in your Bibles, our title is The Ingathering of the Dispersed, Bringing In Again. And here we begin to see themes of comfort, reconciliation, justice, and peace emerging. This is also where we hear those four servant songs that we read in Advent a lot, that a lot of Christians believe point to the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And so here in chapter 60, the author is continuing this theme of comfort and love as they are returning to their new normal, instructing them that despite previous hardship and upheaval, to look up and look around. See the blessings that the Lord has given and is giving in the days ahead. It is an encouraging word that God is good and has good things in store. Things are looking up as they move into this new season of life. In our modern lives today, there are lots of things that herald in new seasons of life. Marriage, death, a baby, moving, a new job. It's endless the ways that we feel newness in our life. And in this season, we are feeling newness in the calendar year and recognize that it brings new life and rejuvenation. Much like those Facebook posts I mentioned earlier, this is the time when we shed off the bad, we shake it away, and begin again looking forward to new gifts and new opportunities that God has in store for us. And for the last two years here in this church, we've celebrated this Sunday of Epiphany with our star words. And for anyone who wasn't here, it was a time when Every person got a little paper star with a word written on it. Words like perseverance, silence, comfort, peace. And these words were to serve for a guide for your coming year. Gifts from God to center ourselves. Ways to grow and watch for God's movement in us. And I know many of us have powerful stories about not being sure what our word was speaking to us for the year. But as the days went on, gaining an understanding and seeing that God is at work through whatever random word was given to you, that you could see it coming. Times that you needed to persevere or times that you needed to be quiet and still and listen. And we will probably do this tradition again in the future, but I thought this year we would kind of flip it a little bit. Because Epiphany, again, what we're celebrating today, is when we remember the Magi's visit to Jesus. And they came bearing gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And if you were listening closely, you will remember that two of these gifts are mentioned in our scripture today. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. And here in Isaiah, it's not necessarily referencing specific gifts brought to one person, but instead to the house of the Lord. Now that people are experiencing stability, they can return to their norms of worship and pay homage to the God of ultimate salvation and adorn the sanctuary with tangible items of praise and thanksgiving. 
And so our flip on our star words this year is not what gift that God can bring to our lives, but what gift can we bring to God and to the world? What would we like to lay down at the altar of salvation to make this world great and give thanks for the wonderful things that we have experienced? In Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, the author writes that we are to be a city on a hill, a light that cannot be hidden. And it concludes the section with this verse. In the same way, let your, shine, your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And we remember from today, arise, shine, for your light has come. And during the Advent and Christmas season, we have two very powerful services which involve light. The first one is our service of remembrance in which we hold space for those of us who might be grieving or are having a hard time with the joyousness of the world around us. And as part of that service, our beautiful communion table here was filled with candles that we lit one by one throughout the service. And so as it went on, this table went from a dark table to a table that almost had an otherworldly celestial glow about it as it was filled with each pinpoint of light coming in. And then as I already mentioned, with the children, we have our Christmas Eve service where we ring the sanctuary with little dots of light passed from person to person, growing brighter and brighter with each time each little light representing God's love, not just for us, but for the world. Each one is a point in a celestial chandelier that never runs out of space for hope and grace and peace. There is a spot for each one of us in that heavenly constellation. And so the question that we have today is knowing that God has called us to arise, to shine, How will you shine? What will your light illuminate in the coming days? And how will you help cast out darkness and provide hope for the world? This epiphany, I encourage you to give thanks for all of the gifts that God has given you, especially in Jesus, but not only in Jesus. I encourage you to look for ways in the world that you can be a gift, that you can shine for the world. So this isn't a call for a resolution, because I know a lot of us struggle with those and keeping them. And also resolutions are about ourselves a lot of times. It's a focus inward for the coming days. This is a call for a revolution, to change the way that we think and act in the world, to commit to finding ways to shine God's light through you to the world so that we can combat against the darkness, so that we can be spaces of hope in a world that is sometimes very frightening and frustrating. If we can push ourselves to shine a little bit brighter and a little bit differently, then maybe God's love will be a little bit more tangible in the world. So I invite you to think And to pray, how can I be a light to the world? In big ways, yes, but also in small ways. There's often a story that circulates around the holidays about people who go to the NICU and hold the babies, give them cuddles and love. And that is a big way to show God's love, to shine bright. But there are also little ways. Smiling at your neighbor putting down your phone for an hour so that you can talk to the people around you, doing things like that, little, little pieces can just slowly amp up the brightness of God's light in this world. So let's think together. Let's pray together of how we can be light, how we can share the gift that God has given us with the world around us this year. Let us pray. God of light and life, 
We give ultimate thanks for the birth of your son and the gift that is given through him. But we also know that you place a call, a charge on our hearts to arise and to shine. To help each one of us push back the darkness and usher in your kingdom, bringing hope and peace and justice and love. Give us courage to shine bright. In your name we pray. Amen.